Did you know Florida has the largest concentration of springs in the world? And there are more than 200 springs just within our district. Today, we're going to dive into the ecology of springs, the challenges they face, and how we can help protect them. This is the Water Matters Podcast. You're listening to the Water Matters Podcast, brought to you by the Southwest Florida Water Management District. We answer your most popular questions about the work we do and services we offer, including new projects, springs protection, water conservation efforts, and more. Learn about the many ways we serve the community and protect your water resources. Welcome to this episode of the Water Matters Podcast. I'm your host, Michelle Sager, and today we're talking about Florida Springs, specifically those within our district. Today I'm joined by Dr. Madison Trowbridge, a spring scientist here at the district. Thanks for joining us today, Madison. Thank you for having me. Let's start with the basics. For those who've never seen one or don't know anything about them, what is a spring? Springs are essentially openings in the ground where water is flowing through. And the reason we have the water is because we have our groundwater from the aquifer. The aquifer is essentially just like a sponge or Swiss cheese, and it holds this water until there's an opening. And because it's under pressure, it pushes that water out and creates that spring. It's a little bit like having a soda can that you shake up and then you open it. It'll force that water out. So when we see these springs, we're seeing that pressure come through into the water body. Yes, you're seeing that release of pressure that force forces okay. it out into the water body. That makes sense. Tell me why these springs are so important. The springs are windows to the aquifer. And what we mean by this is that they allow us to see into the aquifer to understand the health of it and what it is doing. Not all springs are the same. Can you explain how they are categorized? We have two main ways of categorizing springs. The first is going to be location, and the second is going to be by the volume of flow. The location aspect is referred to as a spring group, which essentially means that these springs are all in a similar location and they're flowing to a similar water body. An example of this is Chris River Kings Bay, which is comprised of over 70 different springs that equate to that spring group. We also have magnitude, and this is about the flow. So magnitude, the higher the magnitude, the more flow. And then as you get to the lower magnitudes, that means less flow. First magnitude springs are the largest springs. They're discharging over 100 cubic feet per second. It's a, it's a lot of water. Some of these springs are include Crystal River, a Wikiwachi, just as a couple examples. Second magnitude springs is just a category below that. It's about 10 and 100 cubic feet per second. And this includes systems like sulfur springs. And third magnitude springs are on the lower end as far as the amount of water that's being discharged. And it includes systems like Eulalie Springs in the, in the Tampa Bay region. So it's safe to say that probably the more known springs are those first magnitude springs, correct? A lot of the springs that we know are typically the first magnitude springs, but a couple of the more locally recognized ones may be second magnitude springs. Yeah, I didn't realize that Eulalie was a third magnitude spring, so that's interesting because I do a lot of people do know that in the Tampa Bay area, so that's an interesting fact. We've talked a little bit about the springs themselves. Now let's talk about a spring shed. What is the difference? A spring shed is the area of land that contributes water to the spring. And when you say contributes, what do you mean by that? As water falls to the ground, it's absorbed by the land and it goes to the aquifer. And then from that aquifer, depending on the shape, the different elevations, it'll eventually flow somewhere and likely to a spring. So the area of land up on the surface that goes to a particular spring is part of that spring shed. Now, spring sheds can vary by size. There's some, like Rainbow River, that's several hundred square miles. So the groundwater travel time from each of those areas of land can vary based on years for areas that are closer to the spring vent to even several decades for areas that are farther away. And why is it important um, to understand the role of a spring shed? 
What we do in the spring shed affects the spring itself. I think that's a really interesting point that you're making because I think sometimes people think that, oh, I'm only polluting if I'm near a water body, but that is not true, correct? You can be miles and miles away and still have an effect on a spring, correct? That is correct. The impacts from an area that are closer to the spring will see sooner, but even if you're farther away, we can see those impacts in maybe 10, 100 years down the line. I think this is a great time to talk about the challenges that springs can face, because over time we have seen them threatened by both human activities and natural factors. Can you talk a little bit more about those challenges? While each spring system will have its own unique issues, drivers, and challenges, there's some common drivers to all springs. And this includes rainfall, tropical storms, uh, invasive species, increased nutrients from runoff, as well as recreation. You mentioned recreation. Let's discuss that because these springs really have grown in popularity over the years, and we are seeing more visitors than ever at them. What are some tips we should remember when we are visiting them, and how can we protect our springs? I think the first tip uh, I feel like most people know is don't litter. We don't want a bunch of trash in our springs. But I think what folks don't always think about is when we get out of our vessels, the impacts that we can have from that. If we are out of the vessel, we're probably trampling vegetation of some sort, whether it's on the shoreline, if it's trees or emergent vegetation, or submerged vegetation. So we want to make sure that, if, if possible, we can stain that vessel so that we are protecting the vegetation, which leads to a healthy spring. If we do get out of our vessel, because, you know, people like to swim in the springs, do you have any tips to try and avoid the vegetation that may be trampling it, especially that vegetation that might be um, at the bottom of the of the river? With With the submerged vegetation, try not to just get right on top of it. You know, you can just float and and for the emergent vegetation, you can tie off in the shallow water so that you're not uh, pushing your kayak or, or whatever vessel that you're using up onto the shoreline and causing some erosion. And that um, is a really important point because I think sometimes people don't think, oh, it's not going to be a big deal if my kayak is up here for a few minutes. But we're talking about hundreds of kayaks that, you know, throughout the entire summer that are doing that. And that can have a real effect on the area, correct? Correct. You can think about it like if somebody walks through your yard. If it's just one person, we may not see as many impacts, but if you get people walking through the yard every day, you're going to start to see the impacts on your grass. And and the same thing is true with their springs. That's um, really important. Now, I know that you're out in the springs quite a bit for your work. Can you talk a little bit more about what you specifically do here at the district that involves studying and protecting these systems? I wear many different hats at the district, and every day really seems to be unique. Some days I'm out in the field leading studies or surveys, including our annual submerged aquatic vegetation mapping. But other days I'm in the office and I'm crunching numbers, doing some data analysis on some water quality information or just whatever I'm working on. Recently I did publish a paper on uh, springs and salinity with our submerged aquatic vegetation. And it's really awesome to be able to be in the office one day and then to be, you know, find out that you're published the next day. And not just in the office, sometimes I'm out uh, sharing this information because it is important to f- for everyone to understand what's impacting our springs. So sometimes I'll be presenting at academic conferences, to local groups, or even to other stakeholders like our Springs Coast committees. I'm also helping to support other projects like our restoration projects or any of our other uh, springs initiatives. But one of my favorite things to work on is outreach opportunities, especially with our youth. They're really, I love to see their faces light up when they get to talk about our springs. It's safe to say that you have many years of experience studying springs, um, being out in the springs, visiting with them. Is that correct? That's correct. I have four published papers on springs, and I've been working on springs for approximately nine years. And... The What I've seen is that your love of springs really comes through. This isn't just a job to you. This is something that you're passionate about. Talk about why you love the work that you do. When I grew up, I grew up in Florida, and I got to visit springs, and I felt 
as I was growing up, I didn't think about it too much as far as, you know, going to visit a spring. But then as I got into my academic career and started working on these professionally, I realized just how valuable they are and how different they are. Florida doesn't, is, is very unique and the rest of the you know world doesn't have springs like we do. And it's really a, a blessing to be able to work on these systems. And that brings me to probably my most important question, which is what can we do, all of us, to help protect them? What are some of the things that we can do, even if we're not visiting a spring? There might be things we can do at our own homes. What can we do to help protect these systems? As we talked about earlier, what we're doing in the spring shed can impact these spring systems. So things like using fertilizer sparingly, checking your septic tanks every couple of years, not dumping anything down storm drains or, or you know, disposing of hazardous materials improperly can all impact our spring systems. And we do have some additional tips on our website if folks are interested in, in, in order to see what all they can do at home. This has been a lot of great information, Madison, and thank you for sharing this with our audience. As she talked about with the tips, if you want more information about springs and how you can help protect them, visit watermatters.org slash springs. And thanks for listening to the Water Matters podcast.